Hey guys, and welcome back to EQ Planes, and today I'll be talking about the history of Canada's flag carrier, Air Canada, a history which has spanned 85 years from the 1930s to now. So without further ado, let's explore the history of Air Canada. Air Canada's story actually starts with another company that Canadians may know quite well, CN Rail. At the time, CN Rail was a crown corporation, meaning that the government had major say in their financial and business dealings, so effectively they were owned by the government. In 1937, CN Rail Management and the Government of Canada were looking to expand into the passenger aviation sector, which had at this time not really existed in Canada. And as passenger air travel began to take off in the USA, Canada wanted passenger air travel of its own. So in response, CN Rail created TransCanada Airlines, or TCA. They were given a contract to carry air mail for Royal Mail Canada, also a crown corporation nowadays known better as Canada Post. TCA operated its first flight between Vancouver and Seattle on September 1st, 1937, with a Lockheed Model 10, which you can see pictured here. They also would bring on a Lockheed Model 14 into their fleet the next year. The creation of TCA also inspired opposing rail company, CP Rail, to start CP Air in 1942. TCA continued to grow leading up to World War II with having a cross-country presence. By 1939, someone could travel from Montreal to Vancouver by TCA. But as World War II came, TCA needed to put a pause on their expansions on the home front. Starting in 1943, with instructions from the Canadian government, TCA began operating transatlantic crossings with a small fleet of modified Lancaster bombers, carrying both mail and military personnel across the Atlantic Ocean in order to assist with the war effort. After the war, the civilian Lancasters continued operating regular passenger services until 1947. For anyone watching that's been on a Lancaster or seen the inside of a Lancaster before, you would know it certainly must not have been a super comfortable ride. However, when the war ended, this allowed TCA to have a massive expansion, buying 30 ex-military DC-3s and DC-4s. Not only did they help them fill domestic routes, but also help them expand to destinations in the USA, UK, and Caribbean. As the 1940s drew to a close, all the Lancaster and Lockheed aircraft had been replaced with the fleet of DC-3s and DC-4s, and they had moved their headquarters from Winnipeg to its present-day location in Montreal. During the 1950s, a gradual replacement of these wartime aircraft began. TCA brought the Vickers Viscount, the world's first turboprop airliner, and the Lockheed Constellation into their fleet, which would allow them to better and more competitively serve long-haul routes. They also took their first short-lived dip into the dedicated freighter aircraft market with a small fleet of Bristol aircraft freighters, which only operated for a few years. However, as the 1960s rolled around, the advent of the jet age started. TCA decided to take on the DC-8 and also the Vickers Vanguard turboprop airliner, which quickly brought the complete phasing out of the last DC-3 and DC-4 aircraft, but also the retirement of the only 9-year-old Super Constellation. 1964 brought big changes at TCA, as Parliament decided to make a decision to change the airline's name and branding to Air Canada. During the 1964 tour of Eastern Canada, Queen Elizabeth II became one of the first to fly on the new branding on a DC-8 back to the UK. Throughout the 1960s and early to mid-1970s, Air Canada continued their rapid expansion, made easy by Canada's government regulation, awarding them greater freedom to expand in comparison to their competitor airlines. By mid-1975, they were a complete jet airline with a fleet of 747s, 727s, DC-9s, DC-8s, and L-1011 aircraft, after the retirement of their Viscount and Vanguards. In 1976, Air Canada was separated from their parent company, CN Rail, and made into their very own Crown Corporation. However, after the separation, Air Canada would see less and less support from the Canadian government. Starting in 1978 with the Air Canada Act, the Air Canada Act would end direct control of the government over the airline's routes, prices, and services. The Air Canada Act would allow for a more level playing field with competitors. As since Air Canada was heavily supported by the government and the aviation industry was regulated, it would put them in a significantly advantageous spot. However, this did not completely end the Canadian government's involvement in Air Canada. It was simply the government loosening up on the industry a bit and allowing more competition to happen. As we move into the 1980s, Air Canada once again entered the dedicated freighter market. Using their retired DC-8s, they converted some of them to cargo aircraft and operated these cargo DC-8s until the mid-90s. Air Canada would also bring on the 767-200 in 1983, and that year the 767-200 would take part in Air Canada's most famous incident, 
being Air Canada Flight 143 or the Gimli Glider, which after running out of fuel due to calculations, glided to an abandoned airstrip in Gimli, Manitoba, and landed safely with nobody hurt. During the mid-1980s, Air Canada was looking for more funding in order to support their growing fleet of brand new aircraft, and requested to become a private corporation. The Canadian government obliged, and they were separated in 1985, bringing an end to their time as a crown corporation, and in 1987 the entire Canadian aviation industry was deregulated. However, just before the end of the government involvement, Air Canada was caught up in a scandal with the Canadian government given the name the Airbus Affair. Boeing and Airbus were bidding for a new narrow-body order from Air Canada between the A320 and 737 Classic. The order looked likely to go to Boeing. Boeing had actually gone far enough to purchase Canadian aircraft manufacturer de Havilland Canada. However, some supposed bribery involving Airbus and the Canadian government took place resulting in Air Canada instead ordering 34 A320s under what seemed to be suspicious circumstances, and in result Boeing chose to sell to Havilland Canada. There is certainly a lot more to that situation, but that could be a video all on its own. Also towards the end of the 1980s, Air Canada incorporated AirBC, Air Ontario, and Air Nova as wholly owned regional subsidiaries of the airline, operating mainly Dash 8 family aircraft and the BA-146 aircraft for Air Canada's regional operations. Another interesting tidbit of information is the fact that Air Canada in 1987 was the world's first airline to ban smoking on all flights. Air Canada started out the 90s financially rough due to the impacts of the Gulf War. Air Canada brought in new leadership from Delta Airlines which managed to repair the airline's financial situation. During the 1990s, Air Canada introduced new branding, replacing the branding that had remained relatively unchanged since the 1970s, and brought in a number of new aircraft like the 767-300ERs, A340-300, A330, and A320 family aircraft. They were also able to make large expansions into the United States under the Open Skies Agreement. Also, as the 90s drew to a close, Air Canada became a founding member of the Star Alliance with United, Thai, Lufthansa, and SAS, giving them code share and partnership opportunities with a growing base of airlines. Come the turn of the millennium, as Canadian Airlines, their main competitor derived from CP Air, Pacific Western, and Ward Air struggled, they got into a bidding war with American Airlines and the Onyx Corporation to take over the struggling company. Air Canada took over Canadian Airlines in 2001, merging the fleets of the airlines, consolidating all their regional operations into Jazz, and also starting up budget airlines Tango and Zip, meant to compete with Canada 3000 and WestJet. What Air Canada did not realize was just how bad of a financial situation Canadian Airlines was in. This resulted in Air Canada declaring bankruptcy in 2003 and restructuring into 2004. In 2004, Air Canada had emerged from bankruptcy with a new branding and the retirement of many of the aircraft types inherited from Canadian Airlines. And by then, the 747s, DC-9s, L-1011s and all the other older aircraft were long gone. And Tango and Zip also got the axe. Soon after, new aircraft types would enter the fleet including the E-190 and 75s, triple sevens, along with more CRJs while seeing the retirement of more aircraft like the A340, 767-200, and BAE-146. They also started Project XM, which would put lie flat seats and IFE into many of their aircraft. During the 2010s, Air Canada's financial situation made a recovery. They brought in their new Dreamliners, Q400s, and eventually towards the end of the decade, the 737 MAX and A220. They had also introduced their new vacation carrier, Air Canada Rouge, as well. In 2017, for their 80th anniversary, they introduced their current branding, which is still, as of making this video, being applied to the fleet. And in 2019, they had a proposed merger with Air Transat, which fell through due to a lack of regulatory approval. And the 2019 737 MAX crisis would push back the retirement of some older A320s and 767s. However, it would prove a small bump in the road to what would end up coming in 2020. COVID-19 brought many changes to Air Canada with the retirement of their 767, E-190, A319, and Classic Dash 8 aircraft. Air Canada lost billions and has received bailouts from the federal government. However, Air Canada is building back up after the pandemic as air travel has made a speedy recovery. However, they have not yet returned to profitability as of 2022. Air Canada, for the third time in their history, has entered the dedicated cargo market, this time with old 767s and some 777s in the future. They've also placed orders for electric aircraft and the A321neo. So that's pretty much for it for Air Canada's history. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know if you want to see some more like airline history videos. If, I, if this does well, I could do some other airlines, possibly Canadian Airlines or um, 
or WestJet, but yeah. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. Hope to see you guys back next time.